I'm going to start with something quite risky, um, and then it will all be uphill from there. I'm writing a sequence of poems about fictional thieves at the moment, and this particular one uh, is a fictional thief in a computer game who's Scottish, so it's written in a mixture of, of Scots, 17th century thieves cant, and uh, hive slang, which is a fictional slang dialect from the game. Um, so, apologies to any Scottish people here, but I'm going to try and read this in a Scottish accent and try and do a better job than Brit Eklund did in The Wicker Man. It's called Anara the Shadows. Here's the dark of it. See that tib with the poison pate and the whitely limbs. She's nae jinx skirt. I move nae thib. She can crack a crib with the smallest dub and the glint in her glims. I you clot the tail? I dinna mean her ass. Ay, she's a doctor or Nicky Ben. But I wouldn't speak of it, unless, of course, you yeek for your hearse. She's the tuniest Florence in the bowsing ken. The Lord canna catch her, nor any fox. Oh, she's given them the laugh or hicked. As much of her blood at duke in the box as she is with locks, though the clack in her sconce is what leaves them licked. Uh, I'm going to segue into a poem that also uses some thieves' cant, but uh, is not no, no Scots and no hive slang. And that's the poem that I uh, included of my own in uh, the anthology that me and Kirsty recently edited, Bird Book Freshwater Habitats. It's the second of a series of four bird book books we're uh, compiling, uh, which are intended to cover uh, in illustration and poem all the uh, British species. And uh, my one is uh, Sand Martins, and the poem's called Sandy Swallows. Here's a bank full of skate gallows shored up in their flash ken. The shadows of nooses sharp at their throats and done up in dowdy rigging. Rum divers, the lot of them, some snug in their own hocksters, others spilling in their scores from the shot hold academy like chink from a freshly slit haddock. And drunk on air, each thinking he's a flamelet suddenly loosed from the body of fire, wild before scarpering. Now telling a conundrum to the gull wind, now nabbing a gem from the river's slip. Deft fellows all, animate gungum bobs, burning the wick of their tongues with rickety squall and chaunt, sparking blows and laughing like dice, plundering the banks for their rich dash of sandfly. Now, if, if I heard the sound test right, there might be a coincidence coming up. I think uh, Olivia is going to read a poem called Dust later on. You're not reading that one, or because <laughs> I've got a poem called Dust too. Um, my one is, I'm writing a, an elemental sequence. I, do, I work a lot in sequences. I like, I'm very attracted to sequences, and I'm trying to do one about the classic elements, uh, fire, water, earth, and uh, wind, but I wanted to do... Um, some poems about the in-between elements of these as well. So in between, um, if you combine fire and wind, you get ash, uh, water and earth, you get mud. Uh, I'm going to read two of those. Um, one is dust, if you combine uh, wind and earth. Dust hikes up her skirts for anyone, and then she'll swoon, and then she'll swoon again, in torchlight, in the porch light, or in rain. Dust wakes up in rooms reeking of wine and soon slips on her silken morning gown. Her suitors watch her drunkenly careen. Dust remembers where but never when. She's someone you can coax but not dragoon, the show that started late but overran. Dust is feeling thin, she's feeling worn. She can't quite picture how the night began or how it ended how it came to ruin. And the other one is steam, which is uh, fire and water combined. 
Steam in the changing rooms, stripping off after the race, breathes like an engine. The air is filled up with her loss, her saintly pearlescence, which turns the flesh faintly cerise. Steam lilting out of the shower, feeling limber and loose, can't shake her mood as she slips into clothes. It's a case of lingering heartache, no matter the form of release. Steam drinking sake, her mind on the chance of a kiss, gapes of his listening, as if listening. Oh, but it all sounds so nice. She can't hear a word through the din that's her dreaming, of course. Steam at the mountain spring, bruisy with slovenliness, senses the pain in the milkmaid, the millionairess. The boys whom she sleeps with go swimming, the men reminisce. And I'm going to do now to end with a couple of poems from School of Forgery. Um, first is a short sequence. It's called Seven Kyoku, and it's um, a short seven lines, one for, uh, seven times, one for each character in the film, The Seven Samurai. And they're all collaged from various lines from seven books. I won't go through the list of books, but there, it's a variety of books in a variety of genres. Kambe. Under the hazy, blossom-laden sky, Kambe rubs his head with a sort of blind wonder. The quiet of the lake, too tired to laugh. The outline of a white fox, the oldest game there is. Eyes on the spring hills at the end of the street, Kambe rubs his head once more. Kuzo. Kuzo, buried to the waist in flowers, Mirrored in the autumn lake by Asuka's thunder gate, two strands of hair loose on his face. Rags and ribbons flutter in the wind. The moon shines over the hill field, practically reduced to ashes. Heihachi. Looking through the sawdust, he drops his pipe and tobacco case in sudden amazement, pulls a straw rain cape about his head. A cunning lattice of very light steel, the running stream where Heihachi will meet imagined voices in the water sounds. Shichiroji. All at once the smell of sulfur, the stink of corpses through dust storms like the bulbs of iron plants. Shichiroji's keen senses will ensure his survival. He struggles out of the pond with the stump of a snapped harpoon, the sole pin of an oarlock. Garobi. The saddest thing of all is the scarecrow, a lonely bird, snow blowing in through broken windows. In the first sunlight, three children who circle their terrible father, the moon in his arms, a modest lamp. Oh, Garobi. Garobi, Garobi, Garobi. Katsushiro. After Shino and Katsushiro make love, war clouds no longer hover in broken snatches. The soft folds of her lavender sleeve are damped down at daybreak. Blameless as the flowers of spring, they give way to a final tilt, sending sharp sparks into the air and Kikuchio. Wet with dawn's dew, a lean black dog falls in love with a high-ranked courtesan. Kikuchio pretends disinterest. Apron dangling from his thin neck, he infiltrates the evil Iruka's palace in a cloud of flower and fury, ready now to take charge of volcanoes, the tides. And the last poem I'm going to read is a poem about mustard, in which uh, each line ends in an anagram of the word mustard, and it's called Mustard. It's flavor in the nostrils, a thundercloud smart, like seeing your crush on a superstud's arm. 
You'd have to be sturdier than dermast oak to contain such a bastard stun in your head's barrel and not cry out drams of tears. But if you, in your dilemma, durst eat another spoonful, your throat's drum is often only half as stung, your heart's mud stirred to a soup, and every untoward smut on your tongue it's expunged in one broad strum, leaving nothing, no points, no clear datums from which to measure pain, no lukewarm dust of hurt feelings, rags clinging to an absurd mast, or pins, or crumbs, or flakes of seed-hard must. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.